Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. This is Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. On Science Fantastic, we profile the amazing, jaw-dropping scientific discoveries which are revolutionizing our world and touching our lives. And once again, in this hour, we're going to throw the lines open because this hour is your hour. Okay, well, let's move right along now to the first listener phone call. I'm calling from uh, Lancaster, PA, and the question I have when an atomic bomb explodes, is that one atom being split or more than one atom? That's my question. Bye. Well, you ask a very important question, and the answer to that question, of course, changed the course of modern history. It was Albert Einstein back in 1905 who said that energy and matter were interchangeable, so that in some sense a rock could turn into light. Now, you may say to yourself, that's stupid. I mean, how can a rock turn into light? Well, if that rock is uranium and that light is nuclear fire, then yes, an atomic bomb turns matter into energy or a rock into light. But Einstein himself, in his published works, thought that it was impractical because you're talking about individual atoms. Each atom, one atom, has such a small energy output that turning one atom into light or energy makes no difference at all. So in Einstein's lifetime, he did not think you could make a bomb out of it. However, all that changed in the 1930s when you could split the uranium atom and obtain energy from each atom. But still, the problem was, how do you magnify it? How do you take the energy from one atom magnify it to create an atomic bomb. The man who figured that out was Leo Szilard. And how did he figure it out? He read a book by H.G. Wells, Things to Come. And in that book, in the book, he predicts the future. H.G. Wells, the man who gave us the time machine, the man who gave us War of the Worlds, the man who created science fiction, pretty much, made a prediction that in the future there will be a physicist who discovers the secret of the atomic bomb. Well, Leo Szilard <laughs> read that book and said, oh my God, the prediction is just about to be satisfied. I gotta, I gotta discover the secret right now. So he thought to himself and he realized that there is a way that Einstein missed that you can magnify the power of one atom and that is a chain reaction. So if you split the uranium atom it releases two electrons, approximately. These two neutrons, I'm sorry. Two neutrons are neutral. They then collide with two other uranium atoms, split them, releasing four neutrons. These four neutrons go out, hit atoms, four atoms of uranium, and they create eight. So starting from one neutron, you get two, then four, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, and boom, you get the atomic bomb. So to answer your question, one atom being split does not make an atomic bomb, as Einstein once considered and rejected. Because of the work of Leo Szilard, we can magnify the power of one atom to create the atomic bomb. Then the question is, well, how come the Nazis didn't get the atomic bomb? I mean, they had some of the greatest scientists of the world, like Werner Heisenberg, the creator of atomic physics, working on the atomic bomb. In fact, Heisenberg was the director of Adolf Hitler's A-bomb program. And the answer, well, the answer took decades to finally figure out. But yes, we now know the answer. It turns out that Werner Heisenberg, who worked for the Nazis and was in charge of the German atomic bomb project, did not know one number. He did, not the, he did not know perhaps the most important number of World War II, and that is critical mass. How much uranium does it take to make an atomic bomb, to set off the chain reaction that Leo Szilard once, project, uh, once prophesied would change world history? He didn't know. In other words, how big an atomic bomb do you need? In fact, Heisenberg thought that critical mass was huge, perhaps in the tons. As a consequence, he thought that an airplane could not deliver the atomic bomb. However, we now know the answer. Critical mass is about 20 pounds. 
A piece of uranium, U-235, about the size of your fist, is enough to vaporize Hiroshima. And then the question is, well, how come Heisenberg didn't push to understand what that number was? Well, there was a famous meeting between two of the greatest physicists of all time, Niels Bohr, who was the thesis advisor of Werner Heisenberg, and the student, Werner Heisenberg, and they met in Copenhagen. And there's even a play called Copenhagen about that fateful meeting between the mentor, Niels Bohr, and the student, Werner Heisenberg. And for decades, no one knew what transpired. On one hand, we had Niels Bohr, who fled the Nazis, went to the United States, where he worked on the American atomic bomb, and the student, Werner Heisenberg, who accepted directorship of the Nazi atomic bomb. What happened at that fateful meeting? Well, we now know the answer. The family of Niels Bohr released a letter just a few years ago, a letter that was never delivered, a letter, a letter that Niels Bohr, the mentor, sent to his student about that fateful meeting which determined the course of the A-bomb project, with Niels Bohr going to the Manhattan Project in the United States and Werner Heisenberg re working on the Nazi atomic bomb. That letter says, and it clarifies the mystery, the letter from Niels Bohr to his student, which was never mailed, says that in our last meeting we had, before I left for the United States, you told me that the victory of Nazism was inevitable, and therefore you should join the winning side. Become a Nazi. Join the winning side because we are going to win over the British and the Americans, and we're going to take over the world. Well, Niels Bohr was so horrified by the comment that he left immediately got in an airplane, flew to the United States, almost died in the process. He almost asphyxiated in the process of fleeing hurriedly from Copenhagen to the United States. Well, the rest is, as they say, history. Okay, well, let's move on to take the next listener phone call. Jonathan, I am calling from Inglewood, California. I don't think that time exists uh, can you tell me whether or not uh, you believe it does? Yeah, well, there's some people who say that time doesn't exist, and I don't believe it, but here's the logic of that argument. First of all, the past. The past doesn't exist, because whatever was has fallen apart. Therefore, the past is the past. You cannot retrieve it. The past does not exist. Well, the future. The future doesn't exist either. The future doesn't exist because it hasn't uh, been created yet. And so if the past doesn't exist, if the future doesn't exist, then what is the present? Well, think about it. What is the present? Is the present one second? Is the present a half a second? How big is the present? Well, some people would say the present is instantaneous. It has zero dimension in time. But if it's instantaneous, then for all intents and purposes, it doesn't exist either. And so some people say that time is an illusion. Well, I don't think so. I think the man who got it right was actually William Shakespeare. Shakespeare said that the world is a stage, and we are actors making our entrances and exits on the stage that we call the universe. That was the picture adopted by Isaac Newton, that yes, the past doesn't exist, Yes, the future doesn't exist, but the present is the stage. And what is space? Space is the expanse of the stage. And what is time? Time is a measurement of change, change on the stage of life. And so I think that time certainly exists, but what is it? It is a parameter, like space, that measures something. It measures change. And so time is that parameter which measures change. Now, if time didn't exist, then things wouldn't change. We'd all be paralyzed. We'd all be motionless. And therefore, the universe as we know it could not evolve with time. Now, the question of how, how long is the present has bedeviled mathematicians as well. It was Zeno, the great Greek mathematician, who posed the following paradox. If you cross a river, said Zeno 2,000 years ago, 
you have to go through the midway point of the river. Well, obviously, right? To go from A to B, you have to go to the halfway point. But to go to the halfway point, you have to go to the quarter, quarter point as well. Well, yeah, that's true. Before you reach the halfway point, you have to reach the quarter wave point. But before you reach the quarter point, you have to reach the eighth point. Well, you can subdivide that infinitely from half the distance to quarter of the distance to an eighth of the distance to a sixteenth of the distance to a thirty-second, sixty-fourth, hundred twenty-eighth of the distance. And you can slice it infinitely thin. Then the question is, if it takes an infinite number of time, instance of time, to go through an instant infinity of points, then motion is impossible. In other words, you cannot move. In other words, the universe has no time. Now, think about that for a moment. If you can slice something infinitely thin, but it takes an infinite number of time to slice it infinitely thin, then you can never slice anything then motion is impossible. Well, that's called Zeno's Paradox, and it lasted for 2,000 years. It took 2,000 years for mathematicians to finally figure it out. And who figured it out? Isaac Newton. It is called calculus. Calculus is precisely the way in which you could add infinitesimal slices in order to create a finite result. And so, in other words, time does exist. It's a parameter which measures change. Just like space, just like length and width are parameters that measure the expanse. And so, yes, time, I think, does exist. Okay, let's move right along to the next listener phone call. My name is Mike. I'm calling from Eugene, Oregon. I'd like to hear about uh, Nikolai Tesla's uh, inventions. Uh, are any of them still being used today? Thank you. Well, yes, uh, Nikola Tesla's inventions are used every time you plug something into the wall socket. AC, alternating current, is an invention of Nikola Tesla. In fact, this is called the battle of the currents. See, Tesla was originally a lab assistant to Thomas Edison, but they had some kind of disagreement, so Tesla struck on his own and created uh, another company with uh, Westinghouse. Well, Thomas Edison was wiring up the first city in the world to have electricity, Pearl Street in Lower Manhattan. But he wired it up with DC, direct current. So current only flows in one direction. Well, Tesla realized that that's very inefficient, that if you transport electricity over a distance, the energy loss is much less with AC and much greater with DC. So in other words, you can save money. You can save a lot of money sending current AC rather than DC. You're listening to Science Fantastic. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. Before the break, we had a question about Nikola Tesla, one of the greatest geniuses of the electric age. Unfortunately, we don't remember the name of Tesla too much. Elon Musk, of course, knows the name and decided to name Tesla Motors after the great inventor. But what happened? Well, many of the inventions of Nikola Tesla are with us today. Many of the patents on radio, television that we use today, AC is the most famous of his creations. Well, what happened? Well, it's kind of a sad story. It turns out that Nikola Tesla... Uh, didn't have a team of lawyers backing him up anytime people would try to steal his patents. People realized that Tesla was sitting on multi-billion dollar patents. We're talking about the original patents of radio and television and Sarnoff and other people. I won't go through the details, but yes, they had teams of lawyers and Tesla did not. And Tesla took gigantic risks, creating a gigantic facility in Long Island that never came to fruition. And late in his life, he began to become mentally ill. He suffered from OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. For example, he was fixated on the number three for some reason. And he spent the last years of his life living in a hotel. He was staying at the New Yorker Hotel, which is just a few miles from where I'm sitting right now. 
and he was deathly afraid that someone was going to poison him. He was paranoid. And, of course, you could say that, well, maybe the fear was partially justified because, of course, he was sitting on multi-billion dollar patents and there he was, isolated, without lawyers, uh, suffering from obsessive compulsive disorder uh, and thinking that people were going to poison him. So he died pretty much penlessly, penniless, which is very sad. And, however, we should also point out that in addition to making these incredible inventions, uh, that made the foundation for the electric and television age. He also had some rather unorthodox beliefs. He thought that he could perhaps communicate with Martians, and he thought that perhaps he could extract infinite energy from the vacuum, uh, neither of which panned out. However, the memory lives on. We physicists have guaranteed that Tesla will live, his name will live forever. We physicists have named the Tesla the fundamental unit of magnetism. So when you go to have an MRI scan, uh, ask the doctors what is the intensity of the magnetic field. And they'll tell you that an MRI machine typically has about 1T or 2T. Well, what does T stand for? Tesla. And of course, Elon Musk also knows the great contributions of Tesla, and that's why he named Tesla Motors after Nikola Tesla. Okay, let's move right on to the next listener phone call. This is Randy calling from Seabrook, Florida. I've got the age-old question of which came first, the chicken or the egg? Have a good one. Well, you ask a very interesting question. The answer, I think, is neither. That is, both the chicken and the egg evolved from a much more primitive form millions of years ago. First of all, if you look at the fossil record, you can begin to see that about a half a billion years ago, we had the Cambrian Explosion. Before then, before the Cambrian Explosion, we had single-celled animals, pretty much. After that, we had multi-celled animals of increasing complexity, including primitive backbones. And the question is, where does a chicken and egg fall into that evolutionary framework? Well, if you go back into the fossil record, you can go back, for example, 200 million years ago, where we have the birth of the dinosaurs. But the dinosaurs, of course, laid eggs. In fact, we think the chicken in some sense, is a dinosaur. Living dinosaurs are the birds, we think. Now, even going further back into the record, we have trilobites. Even going back further into the record, we eventually hit the Cambrian explosion 500 million years ago. And at that point, we begin to see, even before that, single-celled organisms. Now, single-celled organisms, of course, don't lay eggs. Single-celled organisms simply bifurcate, split in half. But some of them release spores. And these spores allow them to survive periods of famine, periods of intense heat or cold. And we think perhaps in the spore, we see the possibility of eggs beginning to emerge. And so we begin to see that around that time, around half a billion, half a million, Half a billion years ago, 500 million years ago, the Cambrian explosion, all of a sudden we see the emergence of animals with primitive backbones, with structures like starfish, or the organisms like us with a single backbone. And around that time, around that time, spores eventually became eggs, and all of a sudden the fertilization process became bisexual. So around that time, we made the transition from single-celled organisms, we simply split no chicken, nor egg, those organisms simply split, to more complex modes of survival, like spores, and eventually the chicken and the egg. So both of them evolved simultaneously. Okay, let's move right on to the next listener phone call. My name is William, I'm calling from Virginia. And my question is on Spintronics and its possible applications to technology, and in particular, quantum computing. Thank you. Well, you ask a question that even the CIA is interested in, uh, with all these leaks coming from the government. God, Washington, D.C. is like a sieve. Everyone's leaking documents left and right. How can you run a country if all your secrets are released? Well, one document was rather interesting. It was from the NSA. And it said that, yeah, they were looking at quantum computers. 
They didn't think there was anything there right now. But yes, the CIA, the NSA, and all the spy agencies are looking at quantum computers. So let me explain. We know that Moore's Law is the basis of American prosperity. That's why we have computers that double in power every 18 months. Moore's Law. But Moore's Law cannot go on forever. In the coming decades, for example, computer chips, your Pentium chip, will have layers not 20 atoms across, but 5 atoms across. Once you go down to the atomic level, you get leakage. You get heat creation. And silicon is unstable. Silicon cannot do its magic when it overheats and if you have layers of silicon that are five atoms across. In other words, Moore's Law could collapse. In other words, Silicon Valley could become a rust belt. We have many rust belts in the past. Look at uh, Pittsburgh, for example, and Pennsylvania. We have large areas of the United States where old technology was replaced by new technology, and that's a good thing. It's a bad thing if people lose their jobs, but it's a good thing if we can educate workers to then accommodate the new technology that is being adopted to replace the obsolete technology. Well, here's the question. What's going to replace the silicon computer? That is a multi-trillion dollar question. The CIA looked at it. The NSA looked at it. I'm sure the Russians have looked at it. I'm sure the Chinese have looked at it. And the short answer is, we don't know. Now, <laughs> once we get down to the atomic level, then some people say, obviously, we have to have atomic computers. But atomic and molecular computers don't exist yet. And that's where the quantum computer comes in, as was mentioned. All atoms spin. They're like a spinning top. And if you put them in a magnetic field, they all point in one direction, like up, for example. So imagine an array of spinning tops all aligned vertically. That is a magnetic substance. Then if you make a switch and some of them turn upside down, you've done a calculation. Well, because of the fact that in the coming decade, we're going to see a slowdown in Moore's Law, it means that it could affect the economy. Will you upgrade your computer knowing that last year's model is just the same as this year's model? Are you going to buy a new computer knowing that computer power never changes? No. You're talking about the collapse of a multi-trillion dollar industry. We have to go to the post-silicon era. So, many possibilities have been looked at. Molecular computers, quantum computers, optical computers, DNA computers, protein computers, spintronics, quantum dot computers. But of them, none of them, none of them, I repeat, are ready for prime time. Silicon is very versatile, very easy to handle. It's like a miracle chemical, but it can't last forever. Just like we no longer use gears and levers to make computers, just like we don't use vacuum tubes to make computers, we use chips. But chip technology will eventually get exhausted. So what's going to replace it? Well, one possibility is quantum computers. And why is the Pentagon and the CIA so interested? Because quantum computers can perform calculations and break the code of any nation. I repeat, any nation's codes can be broken by the CIA once you have quantum computers. They're much more powerful than ordinary computers, but hey, they don't exist yet. Because atoms are fickle. The slightest disturbance will make these atoms in a magnetic field tumble and go into random configurations. In other words, the computer becomes useless. Now, what's the world's record for a quantum computer calculation? IBM set the record, and that record is 3 times 5 is 15. Ta-da! Now, children know that, but here's a homework problem. Take 5 atoms, go home, and with that, multiply 3 times 5 to get 15. Well, now you know how hard it is. It is really, really hard to manipulate individual atoms. The slightest vibration, a sneeze a mile away, would be enough to make what is called decoherence, where electrons and atoms fall into total disarray. That's the problem today. By the way, if you want to become a billionaire, 
if you want to have your name in stone, just like Edison, then invent a quantum computer. That would change modern history. At the present time, no one can make a complex quantum computer. Okay, let's take the next listener phone call. My name is Robert. Awesome show. And my question is, why is it that scientists who uh, believe in evolution don't believe in God, since God could possibly be on this evolutionary scale with us? Well, you actually asked two questions, and the first question is about scientists and God, and the third question is, can God be on an evolutionary scale? Well, we can actually answer some of your questions. Uh, the Pew Organization, for decades, has interviewed American people on all sorts of crazy questions, including, do you believe in God? And when they interviewed scientists, they found something interesting. Going back almost a hundred years, going back many, many decades into the past, they found that the percent of scientists who go to church, not just believe in God, forget that, but go to church, is about 30%. Even with all the scientific marvels with astronomy and the space program and stuff like that, even though clergymen no longer look at the heavens to try to find where heaven or hell is located, about 30% of scientists are still religious. Because, of course, religion and science are not necessarily in opposition to each other. I like to quote from Galileo, who once said that the purpose of science is to determine how the heavens go. That's the purpose of science, to determine how the heavens go. And the purpose of religion is to determine how to go to heaven. So, in other words... Religion is about ethics. It's about how to lead the good life. It's about how to be a good Christian or whatever religion you happen to believe in. That's the purpose of religion. The pur purpose of science is to understand natural law, which is different from ethics. Now, as long as we keep these two apart, there's no problem. The problem occurs when people who are believers of natural law begin to pontificate about ethics or when religious people begin to pontificate about natural law. That's where we have problems. Well, the second part of your question goes beyond the question of simply uh, scientists and uh, evolution and God, but can God be placed on an evolutionary scale? Well, I think most religious people would say no, that the accommodation of evolution, religion, and science is not to accommodate God in religion because God is supposed to be the ultimate. God's supposed to be beyond evolution. God does not evolve because of, for example, survival of the fittest or, or evolutionary pressures placed on God. God has no evolutionary pressures. And so the resolution of the problem of religion and God is not that God is on a scale of evolution because many people who would say, who believe in God, that that diminishes God. The resolution, I think, is that there really are two domains. Now, what was Einstein's position on God? Einstein's position on God was there are two kinds of God. The personal God, the God of prayer, and the God of harmony, the God of elegance, beauty, and simplicity. That's the God. The second God is the God that Einstein believed in. Well, unfortunately, our time is up. Once again, you've been listening to Science Fantastic. Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. This is Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. On Science Fantastic, we profile the amazing, jaw-dropping, scientific discoveries that are revolutionizing our world and touching our lives. Every day there's a new breakthrough in science and why not be part of the fun? Okay, moving right along let's take the next listener phone call. My name is Robert I was wondering what happens if a black hole sucks in another black hole? And I'd like to say I love your show, Michio I haven't missed an episode in weeks or months well, you can actually answer your question. We physicists have put it on computers. Remember that Einstein formulated his theory of gravity in 1915. In 1915, they didn't have computers. <laughs> they didn't ha even have adding machines back there in 1915. What did they have back in 1915? The abacus. 
Well, now we have computers. And we can solve Einstein's equations for very complicated configurations that Einstein himself could only dream of. We can now take, take a black hole, put it into a computer, and have it collide with another black hole. And we see something really interesting. This represents the future of the Milky Way galaxy. Go out tonight and do something that you've never done for a long time. Look up. Most, uh, most of us never look up. We spend all our time looking at the floor. Well, look up tonight and you'll see the glorious Milky Way galaxy. But in about five more billion years, the Milky Way galaxy will collide with its nearest neighbor, Andromeda, which is bigger than our galaxy, and it's not going to be pretty. We've actually simulated that on computer as well. What's going to happen is the two galaxies are going to circle each other eyeing each other, circulating each other into a death dance. As Andromeda gets bigger than us, it's going to rip off the spiral arms of the Milky Way, basically ripping our galaxy apart. Then finally, the two black holes at the center of the Milky Way and Andromeda, they also begin to spin around each other in a death dance. As they get closer and closer, the two black holes collide and merge to create a bigger black hole. So, Andromeda is a spiral galaxy. The Milky Way is a spiral galaxy. When they collide, it's going to create an elliptical galaxy, a giant elliptical. And the two black holes are going to merge with each other. In fact, calculations, I mean data taken from Andromeda, shows that there's not just one, but two. Two spots at the center of the Andromeda galaxy. Meaning that, perhaps, Andromeda has already had breakfast meaning that Andromeda has probably already eaten up a smaller galaxy, and its black hole is now at the very center of the Andromeda galaxy. So to answer your question, the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxies will undergo a death dance, eventually leading to the two black holes at the center of the Milky Way and Andromeda executing a death dance. And according to Einstein's equations placed on computers, the two black holes will merge, creating a bigger black hole and eventually an elliptical galaxy. Now, you don't have to take out an insurance policy because this will happen about five billion years into the future. Don't hold your breath. Okay, well, let's move right along now to the next listener phone call. I'm Robin. I'm from Keokuk, Iowa. My question is... Um how do you explain to someone where the white goes when it snows and then it melts? Where does all the white go of the snow? Well, that's a very interesting question, which deals with optics. First of all, why are things white to begin with, and why are things transparent to begin with? When snow melts, it'll turn to water, and it's because the molecule of water has different phases. First of all, why are objects white? Objects are white because it reflects all the colors of the rainbow. If an object absorbs all the colors of the rainbow, it, rainbow is black. And if, all, if an object it, uh, absorbs all the colors except XYZ, then from a distance XYZ hits your eyes, and therefore that's the color XYZ. However, when objects melt and let's say water melts or snow melts and becomes transparent, why is that possible? Because when light hits a molecule of water, it is absorbed by the water molecule, it makes it oscillate, it vibrates. And the vibration re-emits the, the photon, the particle of light, with a delay factor. So that's why light slows down when it goes through water. Because atoms of water absorb the light and then readmit the light a fraction of a second later with a delay time. That's why glass bends light. That's why we have telescopes. That's why we have microscopes. Because when light hits glass, there's a slight delay factor in the readmission of the light wave. And so the wave is delayed. And that's why it bends, bends when it goes through light. So once again, why is snow white? Because in the snow phase, it reflects all light, but it changes completely when it goes into the water phase, where it does not reflect the light, but absorbs the light and then re-emits it, creating transparency. 
Well, the full theory of this is actually quite complicated, but it would take quantum mechanics to really unveil the complete secret of why things are transparent and why things are translucent. And hey, my friends spend a whole lifetime using physics to understand these phenomena. Okay, moving right along, let's take the next listener phone call. Mary, listening to WTAW, where do non-drug-induced hallucinations fit into the mental processes? Thank you. Well, you ask a very interesting question that I actually address in my book, The Future of the Mind. That is, why do we hallucinate, excluding drugs, for example? Well, it turns out that now we have modern physics, we have MRI scans, we can actually see thoughts ricocheting between different parts of the living brain and answer questions that Sigmund Freud could only dream about. We can actually answer and give definitive results for these things. First of all, hallucinations. It turns out that a normal brain hallucinates all the time. Now, that may sound bizarre, but it's true. The human brain generates spurious thoughts all the time. For example, if you're uh, late at night camping out and you suddenly hear something and turn your head, for a brief instant of time, you hallucinate. For a brief instant of time, you think you saw a ghost. You think you saw an animal. You think you saw something there, but close, upon closer uh, analysis, there is no ghost. There is no animal. There's nothing there. And so the brain naturally hallucinates. Or for that matter, take a look at dreaming. When you dream, you are hallucinating, creating whole new new images. Uh, and with a brain scan and MRI scans, we can actually see dreams in formation. Here's how it works. The front part of your brain is your prefrontal cortex. Right behind the prefrontal cortex is your orbital frontal cortex. Both of them are involved with rational thought. Also, fact-checking. Your orbital frontal cortex actually fact-checks you and says, no, 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 that's not right. No, 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 that's crazy. It's a fact-checker. So the front part of your brain is the rational brain. But deep at the center of the brain is your limbic system, and that creates emotions. That memories are processed there. And when you dream, your amygdala fires up. Your amygdala is a very old part of the brain, and the amygdala controls emotions. So when you dream, several things happen. First of all, blood to your prefrontal cortex is largely shut off. Therefore, you no longer think rationally when you dream. Second, your orbital frontal cortex is also shut off, so your fact checker is shut off. That's why you hallucinate. That's why you have these bizarre, crazy things that violate common sense. That's why you can fly. That's why you can talk to dead people. That's why you can uh, talk to the heavens, because right behind your eyeballs, your orbital frontal area is shut off, but your amygdala lights up. Your amygdala controls emotions, particularly fear. That's why many dreams are nightmares, because that part of the brain that governs that lights up. And so you can actually see that because the rational part of your brain is shut off, the emotional part of the brain is on, that's why you can hallucinate and live the hallucination. You think it's real because the fact checker has been turned off. And so, for example, schizophrenia can also be analyzed this way. The left part of your brain talks to you. You're talking to yourself right now. You're saying to yourself, what should I do right now? Should I turn off the radio? Should I go, go to work? What should I do today? That's the left part of your brain that generates voices. However, the front part of your brain understands that. And it says, yes, yes, I am generating a voice. Everybody knows that. But for schizophrenics, the front brain and the left brain don't talk to each other. As a consequence, you think someone's talking to you. Well, someone is talking to you, and it is yourself. You are literally yourself talking to you without your permission. Now, that is normally called madness. And that's what schizophrenia is. Schizophrenia is the most common form of madness. You hear voices. Nothing's there, but there you are hearing these voices because the brain is literally talking to itself. So the point I'm getting at is very simple. Hallucinations can be induced not just by drugs. The brain induces its own hallucinations, either because it shuts off certain parts of the brain, like the fact checker, 
or because parts of your brain don't talk to other parts of your brain, as in schizophrenia. So we're now beginning to understand that hallucinations are much more common than we previously thought. So forget the drugs. Yes, the drugs will also create hallucinations, but it turns out the brain naturally induces its own hallucinations. And then the question is, why? Well, some people think it's evolution. Because when you see things that aren't there, it's actually good for you. In other words, our ancestors were timid apes. If they thought they saw a tiger in the forest, they thought they saw the outlines of a tiger, they ran, even if there was no tiger. But, you see, apes that were foolhardy and super brave said, ha, 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 every time they thought they saw a tiger. And sometimes there was a tiger. And their descendants aren't here today to talk about it because they were eaten up by tigers. So, in some sense, hallucinations were good for us because it alerted us to the possibility of danger even when most of the time there was no danger. But once upon a time, there was danger, and it saved our butt. And that's why we're here to talk about it, because our ancestors were timid. And so some people think that hallucinations are actually good for us to a degree. But when these hallucinations get out of control, then you have mental illness. Okay, let's move right along to the next listener phone call. Yes, my name is Derek. Uh, my question is, Traveling to Mars, how does one travel that great distance without literally going crazy, living in a, literally a tube alone? Well, you ask a question that is bedeviling NASA even as we speak right now. Because going to the moon was a walk in the park, a piece of cake. It was only three days, three days from the Earth, from Cape Canaveral to the moon. To go to Mars is nine months, and nine months coming back. And then, of course, you're staying on the moon, on, on Mars for a few, a few months, and so the whole mission is two years. Can you imagine living in cold, close quarters for two years on Mars with people you don't particularly care for, with people that have habits that annoy you, with people that you don't want to be with on a, on a, on a nice e evening? Well, that's a problem that NASA has to deal with right now because it's not a piece of cake going to, to Mars. And so what do they do? Well, they try to experiment. They try to take ordinary people and put them in cramped quarters, literally eyeball to eyeball for a few months to see what are ways that you can defuse tensions between them. Even married couples have a hard time living with each other. Can you imagine strangers? Uh, going to Mars, having that problem. So in addition to weightlessness, in addition to radiation, in addition to lacking oxygen in outer space, in addition to micrometeorites, we have yet another problem. And that is, how do you get along with people you don't like for two years? There's no simple answer to this. Psychiatrists are working on the problem, even as we speak, because Amara's mission seems to be in the cards. Elon Musk has stated that he wants his company, SpaceX, to go to Mars by around 2024, if not a little bit later. Private Enterprise is getting in the picture. NASA, of course, had its own projection to go to Mars, but its projection was around 2030. And, believe it or not, Jeff Bezos of Amazon wants to go to Mars. And so not one, not two, but three groups have three sets of rockets, one of which will go to Mars first. NASA has the SLS booster rocket. Elon Musk has the Falcon Heavy. And Bezos has a rocket whose name hasn't been released yet, but he has his own rocket base in Texas to prove that he's serious about going to Mars. And so to answer your question is, we don't know. We don't know yet what is the magic formula so you don't go crazy going to Mars having to spend two years with people you don't like. Okay, let's move right along to the next listener phone call. Robert, Las Cruces, New Mexico. Why is the definition of life tied so closely to DNA? I suspect that somewhere in the universe there may be life that doesn't equate to DNA. 
Well, I agree with you. I think that life does exist throughout the universe. So far, we have found 3,600, count them, 3,600 planets going around other stars, of which of which about 20 of them look very much like the Earth, except they're a little bit heavier. So I think the galaxy itself could be teeming with life, in fact, we think that the Milky Way galaxy has billions, I repeat that, billions with a B, billions of Earth-like planets. So the next time you go outside tonight, look up in the heavens, realize that somebody could be looking back at you. And then the question is, well, if they come to Earth and land on the Earth, what do they want? Do they want to eat us? Do they want to mate with us? Favorite thing, themes from science fiction? No, because perhaps... They're not going to be made out of the same DNA. DNA is a molecule. That's all it is. But it has two characteristics. One, it stores information. There's a code along the DNA molecule. And second, it reproduces itself. Now, here's a question for you. How many molecules can reproduce themselves? Can water do it? H2O? No. Carbon dioxide? CO2? No. None of those molecules can make copies of themselves. And that's what DNA does. Then the third question is, what else can do that? And the answer is, we don't know. However, we suspect there must be other DNA-like molecules that are out there. For example, just about, I think, two years ago, there was a group that claimed that a form of DNA with arsenic was found inside. One of the molecules of DNA was replaced by the arsenic atom. That result still has not been proven conclusively, but it just goes to show you that if you take our own DNA molecule and replace some of the atoms with other atoms, you might be able to create a carbon copy of DNA that is chemically different, that has different chemical properties, but reproduces itself. So here's a question. Are there other forms of DNA out there? Well, even on the planet Earth, people have asked a simple question. On the Earth, why don't we have two, three, four types of DNA? We think life got off the ground on the Earth about three and a half billion years ago. We're not sure, but we think that roughly three and a half billion years ago, one molecule was created, DNA. And we are descendants of that one molecule because it reproduces itself. Just like the Sorcerer's Apprentice, when Mickey Mouse reproduced broomsticks, we think that reproduced all the DNA. But the question is, why aren't there two, three, four different types of DNA? The answer is, we don't know. And the question is, are there other forms of DNA that we haven't even thought about, that we haven't even created? And the answer is, certainly yes. In fact, when I see Star Trek or I see Star Wars, I see the aliens, I say to myself, come on, give me a break. They look just like us. Why should life in outer space look just like us? And for that matter, why should they have the same DNA as us? Of course, they're going to have different kinds of chemicals. But DNA is rather versatile. First of all, it's based on carbon. Carbon has four bonds, meaning that it's very easy to create proteins and chains of carbon atoms. So, yes, carbon is quite useful because it creates all sorts of organic chemicals. So we do expect that intelligent life in the universe may be based on carbon. But there's got to be other molecules other than DNA that can contain information and reproduce itself. Okay, well, let's move right along to the next listener phone call. Hi, my name is Rachel, and I was just calling because when I was in school, I had a teacher that told us that everything has its own gravity. So over all this on the on the radio with mass and gravity and their relationships, and just give a general overview of the whole idea. Thank you. Bye. Okay, well, you're absolutely right. Your science teacher was correct. Everything has gravity, and everything attracts each other. Now, you may say to yourself, well, that can't be right for two reasons. First of all, I don't feel, I don't feel gravity attracting things to me. Uh, there's a table in front of me with a book on it. Uh, I'm not attracted to that book, and the book is not attracted to me. Second of all, what about weightlessness? I thought in outer space things are weightless, so there's no gravity in outer space. So it can't be right. 
objects cannot have gravity because why aren't books and tables attracted to me and in outer space how come there's no gravity well let me answer those too first of all Isaac Newton and your science teacher was right everything has gravity but the smaller it is the weaker the gravity is so yes it's true that that book in front of me is attracted to me I am attracted to that book we both have gravity but it's so tiny it's so infinitesimal that you can barely, barely measure it. For example, the Earth weighs, what, 6 sextillion kilograms? That's the weight of the planet Earth. But it takes a mass of the Earth that big to hold me on to my chair. So why am I sitting in my chair? I'm sitting in my chair because there's an object next to me that weighs 6 sextillion kilograms called the planet Earth. It takes that much dirt a huge amount of dirt that's, what, 8,000 miles in diameter? It takes that amount of dirt to create gravity that can attract me to my chair. That's how weak gravity is. But across the universe, it's the only game in town. It's what holds the solar system together. Now, the next question is, well, if there's gravity everywhere, then how come weightlessness exists for our astronauts? Well, weightlessness simply means you have no weight, but there's plenty of gravity out there in outer space. Our space capsules are hurled around the solar system precisely because of the sun's gravity. So why are things weightless? Because everything falls at the same rate, given a certain distance. So, in outer space, your rocket ship falls toward the Earth. But you, inside the rocket ship, fall at the same rate. Therefore, you have the optical illusion that you are weightless. Because you are falling. There is gravity, but you're falling at the same rate as a rocket ship. So here's an experiment. I don't advise you to do it, but here's an experiment. Go inside an elevator and then cut the cable. <laughs> Please do not do this experiment. You cut the cable, you'll find out you are weightless. But there's plenty of gravity when you hit the floor. And then the other question is, well, if there's gravity everywhere, then how come our astronauts have no gravity? Well, actually, our astronauts do have gravity. They have no weight, because weight and gravity are different. So here's an experiment. Go to a theme park, and in many theme parks, they allow you to climb up a long tower, and then they drop you inside a capsule. Inside the capsule, you are weightless but you have gravity. Why are you weightless? Because the capsule and you fall at the same rate, giving you the optical illusion that you are weightless. Now here's an experiment that I do for my astronomy class. I get a large object, like a, like a shot put, and a small object, uh, like a pea. And then I ask the audience, which will hit the ground first if I drop them at the same time? The P or the shot put? Well, the class says, ha, this is an easy one. The shot put obviously hits the ground first. Well, then I do the experiment. And lo and behold, they both hit the ground at the same time. Now let's say I have you in one hand and a capsule on the other hand. Which will hit the ground first? Well, most people would say the capsule is so heavy, the capsule will hit the ground first. No, if I drop you and the capsule at the same time, you both hit the ground at the same time. Then if I put you in the capsule and drop you, you float. You float inside the capsule because you are falling at the same rate. So in other words, because objects fall at the same rate, you have the optical illusion that you are weightless. So in outer space, there's plenty of gravity in outer space, but there's no weight because you're falling at the same rate that the rocket ship falls. Okay, let's move right along now to the next listener phone call. Hi, my name is Trevor. I am from Round Valley, Arizona, and I would like to know why if you are, say, standing inside a semi-truck, if you jump, you don't go to the back while it's going at 60 miles an hour. Thanks for your time, and goodbye. Okay, well, that's a question that a lot of people ask because many of us have been in cars and wonder, gee, inside the car, because you're traveling at 60 miles per hour, inside the car, everything seems normal. If you drop a sheet of paper inside a car, it falls just as if you're stationary. And why is that? Well, you've seen these old World War II movies. 
in these old World War II movies, the cameraman sits right there at the bomb bay, dropping the bombs. They open the bomb bay, and the bomb drops. And does the bomb fall away to the back of the airplane? No. The bomb drops directly behind the camera as if the airplane were at rest. So that's the answer to your question. You are in what is called an inertial frame. Inertial frame is a frame traveling at constant velocity. And so the first law of Isaac Newton says that objects in motion stay in motion forever as if they were at rest. So inside your car, you're traveling at 60 miles per hour. Inside the car, everything is normal. You are in inertial frame. And the first law of Isaac Newton says that inside your car, the laws of physics are the same as if you are at rest. So if you drop a bomb out of the bomb bay of an airplane going at hundreds of miles an hour, the bomb drops straight down. You can see the bomb drop as if your airplane were at rest. This is also true in outer space. Our astronauts travel at 18,000 miles per hour. It's a huge velocity in outer space. But do they see objects falling to the back of the air of their space capsule if they jump? No. It's as if the space capsule were at rest. And that's an example of Newton's laws of motion. That objects traveling at a constant velocity, the laws of physics are the same as if they were stationary. And that's why in a speeding car, everything sound, everything feels as if everything is totally at rest inside a speeding rocket or inside a speeding car. It it's all it goes back to Newton's first law. Okay, well, let's move right along now to take the next listener phone call. My name is Wesley. I'm calling from Chattanooga, Tennessee. My question is about when a satellite is orbiting the Earth on the TV, it shows a big zigzag. And I wonder if that's due, in fact, to uh, the speed of the Earth and the speed of the satellite or why that's so. But anyhow, that's my question. Well, I'm not quite sure what you mean, but when a rocket fires, it moves in a straight line. Uh, because of the curvature of the Earth and the spin of the Earth and so on and so forth, it then curves arcs across as if it goes in a huge circle. However, as the satellite goes around the Earth many times, and you were to graph the trajectory of the rocket as it moves along the Earth, you have many parallel lines. So even if a rocket is launched from Florida and it starts to orbit the Earth, you do not have the orbit going over Florida constantly. No, it starts to go over maybe Texas. It starts to go over maybe the Atlantic Ocean because the Earth is spinning beneath the satellite. And so when satellites go around the Earth and you put the trajectory on a gigantic screen, it does not go around Florida forever. No, it starts not to go into a zigzag, but it seems to go in a spiral because the Earth spins underneath the uh, rocket. In fact, in 90 minutes, the satellite will go completely around the Earth as the Earth spins. Okay, well, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Once again, this is Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. This is Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. On Science Fantastic, we profile the amazing, jaw-dropping scientific discoveries that are revolutionizing our world and touching our lives. And in this hour, once again, we're going to throw the lines open because this hour is your hour. Let's get right to the phone calls. Let's have the first listener phone call. W. I'm wondering why the International Space Station is not shaped like a giant wheel as designed by Werner von Braun. Thank you. Well, good question. If you, if you saw the movie 2001, it starts off with gorgeous, beautiful spinning wheels in outer space. And to answer your question, there's a dirty word, a four-letter word, C-O-S-T. 
cost. It simply costs too much to create spinning wheels in outer space. Now, why bother to spin a spacecraft at all? Because you want artificial gravity. Without gravity, you are weightless, and all sorts of bad things happen to your body. You have muscle deterioration, loss of calcium and phosphorus and other minerals from your, your bones. In fact, your spinal cord even expands about an inch and a half to two inches. You actually are taller being in outer space. So you have all these problems dealing with weightlessness, and the way to eliminate weightlessness is to get artificial gravity, that is, spin the spacecraft. We've all been at carnivals, and at carnivals, they spin you around, and you feel a force, a force pushing you into the chair, and that's called centrifugal force. Now, we could do that with the space station, except it would cost an awful lot of money. That's why the space station looks like a bathtub. It's very inelegant. It's not streamlined. It doesn't take your breath away at all, like the wheels that you see in the movie 2001. But hey, they work, and it just means that our astronauts have to do exercises in order to keep their muscle toned, in order to keep their bones from disintegrating. They have to constantly exercise in outer space. So in the future, maybe we'll have spacecraft that do spin, for example, going to Mars. The trip to Mars will take about nine months. That's an awful long time to be under weightlessness. And so some people have said that maybe we should spin the Martian spacecraft to give them artificial gravity. Well, yeah, great idea. But it boils down to one word, cost. It costs about $10,000 to put a pound of anything in orbit. Uh, That's your weight in gold, just so you can orbit the Earth. To put a pound of anything on the moon costs on the order of $100,000. And to put anything on Mars would cost upwards of a million dollars a pound. So it's very expensive to create spinning spacecrafts. We could do it. It's an engineering problem, but basically it's a political and economic problem. Basically the question is, who's going to pay for it if we have spinning spacecraft? Okay, let's move right on to the next listener phone call. Dr. Kaku, my name is Ralph, and I'm listening um, from Great Falls, Montana, on uh, station KQDI. And my question is, I know we have seasons because the Earth's axis is tilted, but what I would want to know is the reason why we're tilted is because um, the theory is we were hit by an object billions of years ago and threw the axis into the tilt. What the Earth be like if we were never hit by that object and um, we didn't have that tilt? What would our climate be like? Thank you very much. Well, you ask an interesting question. When I teach astronomy at the university, uh, the first day I ask the kids a simple question because I want to know how much they know. I ask them a simple question. Why is summer hot and why is winter warm? And I give them an array of possible answers. Uh, One of them is that maybe the sun is closer to uh, the Earth during summertime, and the Earth is farther away during wintertime. The other is a possibility that maybe the Earth tilts. And third, well, maybe there's another reason. And the answer I get from the kids is uniformly the same. About a third, about a third of the class swears that is due to the fact that the Earth is closer to the sun during summertime. That's why we have summer. A few holdouts, maybe like oh, a tenth of the course, says, no, 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 it's a tilting of the Earth. Uh, because of that, not every place on the Earth gets equal amount of sunlight, and that causes the seasons. And about half the class don't know at all. Well, the answer, as you probably guessed, is the Earth tilts, 23 degrees approximately. And that's why summertime... The northern hemisphere is tilting toward the sun, while the southern hemisphere is tilting away. That's why when it's summertime in New York, it is wintertime in Australia. So how do you explain the fact that it's the opposite season on the other side of the Earth? And the reason you can explain that is by assuming that A, the Earth is round, and that B, it tilts 23 degrees. Well, let's take a short commercial break, but after the break, we'll answer the question, what happens if there was no tilt at all? If there was a cosmic accident and we weren't hit by an asteroid four billion years ago, what would it be like if there was no tilt at all? The caller asked the question, if there was a cosmic accident and we were not hit 
by an asteroid about 4 billion years ago when the solar system was being created, and the Earth does not tilt with respect to the plane of the solar system, what would the weather be like? Well, there are many cosmic accidents, of the most famous being 65 million years ago, if that comet or meteor that was destined to hit Mexico missed by just a little bit, well, the dinosaurs would still be here. That asteroid hit just at the right point where it plowed into Mexico. Enough dirt and garbage was thrown into the air to darken sunlight, plunge temperatures, and wipe out the dinosaurs. It was a cosmic accident, in some sense, that humans are here today and not dinosaurs talking about uh, questions to scientists. Well, the other question was asked is, what happens if the Earth does not tilt at all? Well, we would still have weather because the equatorial plane is still the closest to the sun in terms of the angle. If you're further toward the North Pole, uh, then you get less sunlight. It wouldn't be as dramatic as we have it today with a 23 degree tilt. And that means you would have convection currents. That is, you'd have warm air from the equator of the Earth rise, go toward the north, and go to the south in a circle. So you would have a circular circulation of wind. So the weather would be rather strange. You would not have east-west weather so much, assuming that the planet didn't spin so much. Now, if, this, if the planet spins, on the other hand, then you can get east-west winds. So our Earth has the benefit of both. It tilts, so we have dramatic changes in summer, fall, winter, spring. And second of all, it spins, and when hot air rises, the Earth spins beneath the hot air, creating wind. So, uh, kids ask the question, why do winds blow? Winds blow because hot air rises, the Earth spins beneath the air, and so the air moves with respect to the surface of the Earth. So the winds on a planet that does not rotate and is aligned vertically with respect to the ecliptic plane, would have a very strange set of weathers. We wouldn't have east-west winds, but they would be north and south, the winds on such a hypothetical planet. And somewhere in this universe, I bet you there are planets that are vertically aligned to the solar system's plane. We have found so far 3,600 exoplanets orbiting other star systems, and I bet you when our instruments get better, we'll probably find a handful of them that are just like that, that spin like a top, such that they are aligned vertically with respect to the plane of the solar system. Okay, well, let's move right on to the next listener phone call. My name is Daryl. Uh, I'm from Ohio. As I understand, there are gases in the universe, certain gases, and my question was that if you took a, say, a lighter or something and lit it in space, would it catch on fire or explode? Uh, is there any chances of that happening? Well, you ask an interesting question that a lot of people ask, and that is, can you light a match in outer space? Uh, well, the answer is no. In order to get a match going, you need at least two things. First of all is you need fuel. Second of all, you need oxygen. Oxygen is the oxidizer, and the combination of the two gives you the spark that sets things on fire. Now, you've probably seen astronauts on the space station. They can light a match. They can light a lighter in the space station. It's not recommended, of course. Uh, and why is that? Because there's oxygen inside the spaceship. As long as there's oxygen there you can light a match and have combustion. However, you cannot do that in outer space. You cannot do that underneath the oceans. For example, some scientists have speculated that if they are aliens in outer space, more than likely they may be aquatic because we see lots of evidence of oceans in outer space, like in the moons of Europa, Enceladus, the moons of Saturn and Jupiter. So if there are aquatic species, will they become advanced? technologically advanced. Well, maybe, but there's a problem, and that is you cannot light a match underwater. You need an oxidizer. And since there's very little oxygen in the oceans and it's cold, uh, you cannot light a match under the oceans. You cannot light a match in outer space. Okay, well, let's move right along to the next listener phone call. My name is Edward from College Station in Texas. My question is, why is it we can see out there deep in the universe with Hubble 
but we couldn't use it to see Pluto. Well, you ask a very interesting question. First of all, when we look at radiation from the Big Bang, uh, the radiation from the Big Bang, of course, is spread out. However, Pluto is a very tiny object. Uh, its angular distribution with regards to the Hubble Space Telescope is very, very tiny in terms of seconds of arc. So we do have pictures of Pluto from the Hubble. We do have pictures. I've seen them. They're not very impressive. Of course, since then, we have sent the New Horizons spacecraft to Pluto and have gorgeous pictures of the flyby that took place. Uh, in fact, there's even one side of Pluto with a gigantic heart-shaped, heart-shaped can, uh, crater, not crater, uh, planes on the surface of Pluto. We also know that Pluto has moons, more moons than we previously thought. So Pluto is much more complex than we originally suspected. And again, the Hubble Space Telescope does give us fuzzy pictures of Pluto. So it is very tiny. It's a very tiny object out there. And even the Hubble Space Telescope strains to pick up that radiation. Also, the radiation from the Big Bang, uh, some of it was collected by, not by the Hubble, but by the COBE satellite and the WMAP satellite. And they scanned the heavens for that radiation. You've probably seen those pictures of the explosion itself. Uh, go to nasa.gov, uh, type in COBE, C-O-B-E, or WMAP, W-M-A-P, or back, microwave background radiation. Google that, and boom, you can actually see what the fireball looked like. Uh, yes, it was a fireball. You can see the ripples of energy. And that is a baby picture, a baby picture of the infant universe about 300,000 years after the instant of creation itself. So, as magnificent as the Hubble Space Telescope is, there are limits. For example, if the Hubble Space Telescope is pointed at Neptune, uh, again, you see a fuzzy ball. You can actually see dark spots on Neptune and things like that, but not much more. There are limits to the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay, well, let's move right on now to the next listener phone call. Hello, Dr. Kaku. I'm familiar with Einstein's idea of gravity. You know, you've talked about this trampoline, you know, and dropping a bowling ball on the trampoline, and that's kind of how the gravity field uh, operates with other objects in the universe. My question is, is this theory of gravity, is this compatible with the notion of graviton? I'm not completely sure about that, so I was hoping you could shed some light on that. Um, if you have really short time for another question, if you could quickly perhaps just tell us, how did we discover the atom? You know, we look around, you know, was it with microscopes? How did we find out what the smallest blocks of the universe actually, um, the nature of that object? So uh, thanks for taking my call. Okay, well, you ask a very interesting question. If you are a Star Trek fan, uh, you know that they have graviton beams. And people ask the question, well, what is that? What's the difference between gravity, Einstein's theory of curved spaces, and gravitons? Well, a graviton is a particle of gravity, like the photon. What is a photon? A photon is a particle of light. Now, light, of course, is a wave, and associated with that wave is a particle, and the wave of light is called the photon. Now think of gravity. Think of gravity as being a, a bed sheet or a trampoline net, and there are ripples, tiny little ripples which vibrate on the surface of that trampoline net, and those are the gravitons. So gravitons, like photons, are small vibrations on the larger sheet that we're talking about in the case of gravity, or vibrations in light. And so that's the relationship between photons and light, gravitons and gravity. So briefly, gravity, of course, is what holds you on the floor. Gravity is what warps space and time. But ripples, small ripples on the surface of space-time are what we call gravitons. Now, have we ever seen a graviton? Have we ever measured one? And the answer is no, absolutely not. However, we physicists firmly believe it because eventually you must quantize Einstein's theory of gravity. You see, we have two different formalisms. One is the formalism of Einstein, which, which is based on smooth surfaces, which can ripple and warp. That's why we have black holes. That's why we have, that's why we have all the things you see in science fiction movies. That's Einstein's theory of warp space-time. But the quantum theory deals with vibrations. It deals with particles that oscillate. And how do you marry the two together? 
Well, at the present time, it's very difficult. It's one of the outstanding problems in all of physics. But the way we do it is we take Einstein's theory, we put ripples, ripples on Einstein's theory, and then we quantize each of the ripple to become a particle, which is called the graviton. Also, who, who, who discovered the atom and who took a picture of it? Well, of course, the concept of the atom goes back to the Greeks 2,000 years ago. Atom means cannot cut. Tum means cut. A means cannot. So the word atom means cannot cut. But now, of course, we can blast atoms to pieces. And how did we do that? Well, let's take a short commercial break. And after the break, we're going to talk about how we can see the atom. How do we do that? We'll find out after the break. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. Hey, this is your hour. Okay, well, before the break, we had a question uh, about the atom. How do we see it? How do we know they're there? Well, believe it or not, the first person to actually give us concrete evidence of atoms was Albert Einstein. When he was unemployed, he was working as a clerk in the patent office. He said that if atoms exist, they must vibrate and bump up against particles of dust, small little particles that we see, and therefore under a microscope, we should see tiny little dust particles move. Well, sure enough, you can do that. It's called Brownian motion. When you get a microscope and look at a very, very small object, you can see little tiny vibrations there because atoms buffet themselves and hit small particles of dust. And from that, Einstein got one of the first indicators of the size of an atom. Now we can actually photograph individual atoms. Believe it or not, it was once thought to be impossible because the wavelength of light is larger than an atom. Therefore, a light can only see objects down to the wavelength of light. Therefore, you can see big objects like elephants, horses, and trees. But when you get smaller and smaller and smaller, eventually you hit the wavelength of light and everything gets fuzzy and you cannot see things smaller than the wavelength of light. But it turns out you can using what are called phase microscopes. What you do is you get a needle, a very tiny needle with an electric charge, and you run that needle over a surface. And then you move that needle very slightly and run it over again and again and again, just like a record player. That's, how, of course, how we etch records, by having a tiny groove go one by one, creating lines on a piece of vinyl. You can do almost the same thing with atoms, and sure enough, when you do that, when this needle bumps over an atom, it, it registers a bump. And you can actually see this on, on Google, if you Google it. You can actually see pictures of atoms arranged in a crystal. We once thought that was impossible. But hey, we do it now. We can actually photograph individual atoms by looking at the distortions they make on a needle, very tiny needle, as the needle sweeps across a surface. Absolutely amazing. Okay, well, let's move right on to the next listener phone call. Dr. Kaku, I'm sure you know about the well-known atomic doomsday clock. If there were an environmental doomsday clock, what time, in your opinion, would that clock be set at if we continue on our present course of interaction with the environment? Thank you. Well, you ask an embarrassing question because, yes, there are scientists who say that we're at 11 o'clock, we're one minute to midnight, and so on and so forth. Well, that makes great copy for the newspapers, but for a scientist, it's kind of frustrating because there's so many different parameters involved that it's really impossible to say things other than that we are very close, that things look very bad for the next few decades. First of all, we are not at the point of no return. When we look at nuclear proliferation, we look at the greenhouse effect, uh, we looked at uh, biogerms. These are three technologies that, in principle, can destroy humanity on the planet Earth. A fourth one might be the loss of biodiversity. That is the fact that we humans are destroying other life forms on the planet Earth. But when you, when you boil it down, the press wants to know, is it going to happen next year? Is it going to happen in five years, ten years? Give us a date. And you can't, because any time you give a date, the date is obviously going to be wrong. However, we can say some general things, and that is by mid-century, by mid-century, some cities could be underwater. Be at the rate at which the Earth is heating up, the glaciers are melting, and sea levels are rising, 
it means that nor'easters or storms can throw huge amounts of water right over the barricades, right over the dikes and levees into a city like New Orleans, like Boston, New York, L.A., San Francisco, and overwhelm the system. And so these are, these are things that we have to worry about in the coming years to coming decades. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. The lines are open. Okay, well, before the break, we had a question that is very hard to answer, and that is how close are we to doomsday with the environmental clock? Some people put it at one minute to midnight. Some people put it at 11 o'clock. I mean, what do these things mean anyway? I think you have to break it down concretely. First of all, nuclear proliferation and nuclear war. Yes, that's something that we have to worry about. The hot spots of the world are... The Korean Peninsula, as North Korea develops more nuclear weapons and ICBM capabilities, that could come to fruition in the next few years, by 2020. By 2020 at the earliest, some experts in the United States predict that North Korea will have their first ICBM capable of putting an atomic bomb on Los Angeles. At that point, the President of the United States is going to have to make a lot of military decisions, not to mention the perpetual problem between India and Pakistan. They have fought several hot wars with each other. They're both nuclear armed, and that is pause for thought. And then we have the Iranian situation. Uh, the Iranian treaty that we signed with them, for good or bad, has a flaw. Even its supporters say that there is a flaw, and that is after the treaty expires and Iran is no longer bound by the threat of sanctions, they could go on to produce an atomic bomb. So in other words, in some sense, we are allowing them to create the infrastructure, to create the laboratories short of a bomb because of the treaty. But after the treaty is over, when they are one screw turn away from assembling a nuclear weapon. So for all these reasons, that's a problem for the, the doomsday clock. Then, of course, we have biogerms. Uh, already we can begin to weaponize viruses. For example, if you take HIV and then weaponize it by making it airborne, then if somebody coughs, they can inhale the HIV. Well, thank goodness right now HIV is not airborne. But, hey, in the era of genetic engineering, it could be possible that somebody could alter the genes so that it do does become airborne. And then we are in deep doo-doo if that happens. And then, of course, we have global warming. Global warming is dangerous on a scale of decades. So don't think that tomorrow, all of a sudden, the Earth is going to be unlivable. No, it'll take years. And in those years, hopefully, politicians will rise up to the fact that, yeah, maybe we should create a world based on hydrogen, a world based on fusion, a world based on non-polluting technologies. Why not? Well, we'll have to, of course, wait and see whether the politicians have enough wisdom to see that, yes, there are some long-term threats. But exactly what time is it? It depends. Okay, let's move right along to the next listener phone call. Hello, Dr. Kaku. This is uh, Richard from Dallas. I was wondering, sir, if you think that cold fusion is even feasible. Uh, thank you. Well, ever since um, ever since humans began to speculate about energy and things like that, people have proposed free energy. Energy for free. Wouldn't that be great? Put the oil companies out of business and all that. Well, there are problems. Some people think the closest we can get to free energy is cold fusion. So let me explain. Several years ago, uh, two chemists revealed the fact that if you put palladium rods into water, the palladium rods will eventually start to release energy. In fact, energy from fusion. They claim that the palladium has magical properties and it brings atoms of hydrogen closer together. As a consequence, they're so close that you can fuse them to create helium. And that is the secret of the stars. That's why the sun shines. The sun shines because it compresses hydrogen to millions of degrees so that the hydrogen nuclei plows into other hydrogen nuclei releasing the energy of the hydrogen bomb. That's the secret of the stars. That's why the sun shines. 
That's why the stars twinkle, and that's why we are here today. Now, the question is, is it possible that one day this kind of technology can give us free energy in the form of cold fusion? Why do we have to heat up the hydrogen? Well, it's very difficult to heat up hydrogen. We have to heat it up to millions of degrees so that protons, which don't like each other, are forced to combine to create helium and release vast amounts of energy. Cold fusion was the hope that you could do it in a bottle. Forget the sun. Forget millions of degrees. No. Room temperature water could create energy. Well, these two chemists, um, Fleischmann and Pons, claim to have gotten energy from almost nothing. Created a big sensation, but then it was not reproducible. And that's the key. Who knows whether it's really correct or not? I would say 99% of most physicists think it's nonsense and violates the laws of quantum mechanics. However, there's a holdout, and these holdouts think that, well, maybe one day it'll create an energy revolution. But the question is, is it reproducible? To be considered science, you have to things, have things that are testable, that are reproducible um, in the laboratory, or else it's a fluke or else it's fake, or else it's another effect taking place. So far, it's not reproducible. That is, people in one country say, we've done it, we've done it, fusion in a bottle. But other people on the other side of the earth, when they do the exact same experiment, get nothing. In fact, Toyota, they said, put down over a million dollars to try to perfect coal fusion, because, well, who knows? A million dollars is not much if you're the world's largest automobile maker, and maybe it works. However, what happens when you build a Toyota? You turn the switch and it doesn't work. It's not reproducible. It is useless at that point. Okay, well, unfortunately, time is up. 